This video gives a bunch of different ways of saying that a matrix is invertible. Let A be an n by n matrix. Recall that we say that A is invertible. By definition, that means that there exists an n by n matrix, call it x, such that A times x is the identity matrix and x times A is the identity matrix. That's the definition of A being invertible, but there are five other properties that are equivalent to this. In other words, if any one of these properties holds about matrix A, then all the rest of them hold also. And if any one of these properties fails to hold for A, then all the rest of them also fail to hold. I'll talk through these properties, but for a rigorous proof of why they're all equivalent, you'll need to look in another video. Statement two says that there exists a matrix B such that B times A is I. So certainly if A is invertible, that's true, right? Because if A is invertible, there's a matrix that we can multiply on the left or the right and get I, and here we just need to multiply on the left to get I. But it turns out that having B times A equals I for square matrices also implies that A times B has to equal I. And so if statement two is true, then statement one is also true. Similarly, it turns out that if A times C is I, then C times A is I. So if statement three is true, then statement one is also true. And of course, going the other direction, if one is true, if A is invertible, then there certainly exists a matrix C that's a right inverse. So statements two and three are both equivalent to statement one. Now let's look at statement four and see what that has to do with statement one. Suppose that A is invertible. Then there's a matrix X that solves the matrix equation, X, A times X equals I. And solving this matrix equation is equivalent to taking the matrix a augmented by I and converting it to reduce row echelon form. When we do this, we're really just solving systems of linear equations, one system for each column of I. Well, since we know there's a solution, when we do the reduced row echelon form, we know we're gonna have to get an I where A used to be, and then some other stuff where the I used to be. If we didn't get an identity matrix on the left-hand chunk, if we got something else with a row of zeros and some columns that didn't have leading ones in them, then we wouldn't have a unique solution here. We would either have no solution or infinitely many solutions, neither of which is possible if A is invertible. So therefore, A being invertible means that the reduced row echelon form of A has to be the identity matrix. And to go the other way, if the reduced row echelon form of A is the identity matrix, then that means that we can solve A times X equals I. We can just read off the solution from the right side after we do the reduced row echelon form. And so therefore, we're in situation of three, which we said was equivalent to situation of one. Now, what about this fifth statement? that the vector equation AX equals B has exactly one solution for every n by one vector B. Well, if A is invertible, then to solve the equation AX equals B, we just multiply both sides on the left by A inverse, and we get that X is A inverse B. So there's definitely just one unique solution. On the other hand, going the other direction, if AX equals B always has a unique solution, then when we row reduce any matrix like this, then we end up having A in identity form. And we've seen from previous work that that's, that's four, that that implies one. So A being invertible is also equivalent to statement five. Finally, let's consider statement six. Statement six says the equation A times X equals zero has exactly one solution. That solution is necessarily gonna be the zero vector since 
any matrix times a zero vector is a zero vector. Well, the argument that this is equivalent to A being invertible is pretty much like the last one. If A is invertible, then the equation AX equals the zero vector can be solved by multiplying by A inverse, which gives us a unique solution. And if AX equals zero has a unique solution, then a similar argument says that A has to be re reduced to the form of an identity matrix and therefore A is invertible. So all of these conditions are equivalent. We've seen that if A is invertible, then AX equals B has a unique solution for any vector B. But what about if A is not invertible? What can we say about the number of solutions to the equation AX equals B in that case? Well, we know for sure that this equation does not have one unique solution. Since if it did, the same sort of argument we used before would say that A would be reduced to the identity matrix and A would be invertible. So this equation cannot have one unique solution, so it must have either no solutions or infinitely many. That's because there are only these three possible options. One unique solution, no solutions, or infinitely many solutions whenever we have a system of linear equations as this vector equation represents. One note, in the statements on this page, I'm talking about n by n square matrices, since those are the only matrices we really talk about whether they're invertible or not. If A is not even a square matrix, then the situation is more complicated as far as how many solutions an equation AX equals B can have. In this video, we saw a bunch of different but equivalent ways of saying that a matrix is invertible. A key idea was that invertible matrices were reduced to look like the identity matrix.